Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today we're just going to look into God's word and as we open God's word, he gives us knowledge and understanding of his scriptures. So today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism. And throughout scripture, we see that God first requires repentance to receive salvation. And repentance means to turn away from your own sinful ways and to turn in faith and believing, putting your trust in God and walking in his ways. All right. So it's a it's a turning away from our own life, from sin and turning and walking God's way. It's a change of life. Hallelujah. And, you know, we all know what it is to struggle in life and go through in our own strengths and so forth. But, you know, God, if, we, if we're, our life's in him, he's got it covered. And so after we do repentance, then follows water baptism in his name and Holy Spirit baptism. And these two baptisms are separate occurrences. John the Baptist, he spoke of two baptisms. So I'm going to open my King James Bible to Matthew chapter 3. And we read here in verses 11 and 12. And this is what John the Baptist said. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But there cometh one after me who is mightier than me, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hallelujah. And John Baptist, he went on to say in verses 13 and onwards, it says here, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. That means he allowed him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that wonderful? God the Father says of Jesus, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus, we just saw there, was fully immersed in water. Right? Jesus' baptism was not a sprinkling of water because he came up out of the water. And Jesus also received the Holy Spirit. And Jesus led by example, and we're to follow his example. And Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. So to us, we need to be water baptized by full immersion and not a sprinkling of water. And after Jesus was baptized in water, the Spirit of God descended upon him. And after the water baptism, we too are to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. And after water baptism, um, after the water baptism, then we can follow on and receive the Holy Spirit baptism. And you know, water baptism is follows repentance. And therefore, water baptism is not for babies because they've not repented of their sins. You are a baby or a little child doesn't know what a sin is. They don't know. But it says after repentance comes water baptism. Babies, however, and we use the word christening, but they can be donated, sorry, dedicated to God and prayed for. And that's how, and the examples of those are in the Bible. All right, so babies uh, are not water baptized, fully immersed in water. Hallelujah. And so when Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, he became Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, or Jesus Christ. And then I'll just read it. In Acts 10, 38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So after Jesus was baptized, we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says here, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John the Baptist was saying. 
turn away from sin and turn to God. And then Jesus comes along and says, repent, turn away from sin and turn to God. And, and again, that word repent, it means to turn away from your sinful ways and turn in faith, walk towards God. Hallelujah. And walk in God's ways. It's not just believing in God. He wants us to walk in his ways. And, you know, Jesus taught his disciples how to baptize correctly. And we see this in John chapter 3, verse 22. John chapter 3, verse 22. And it says here, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea and there he tarried with them and baptized. And then chapter four, verse one and two, it says, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, all right? So Jesus wasn't baptizing people. Jesus' disciples baptized people. And Jesus himself, he told the disciples how to baptize people. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. And we read here in verse 19 and 20. And Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Isn't that great that the Lord said he's going to be with us always. So no matter how your day is going, the Lord's with you. Hallelujah. And also Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, so Jesus told them to baptize people. And Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Sometimes people just think preaching is just behind the pulpit. But preaching just means sharing with people, communicating. You can do that over a cup of coffee. You can do that um, just when you're walking along or in a, in a supermarket or wherever you are. It's whenever you get alongside people, you can share Jesus to them. And Jesus is saying, we need to do that. Hallelujah. And Jesus spoke of baptism in water and baptism in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, chapter 1. So it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and then Acts, chapter 1, verses five and 4 and 5. And it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So this is what Jesus was saying to the disciples. But wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days thence. So remember I said before, there's two baptisms, a water baptism and a baptism in the Holy Ghost. And even in um, Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter, he preached repentance and water baptism. Chapter 2, verse 37 this is what uh, Peter said. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And, and then Peter tells them what they need to do. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you. So no one was to miss out. Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, one and the same. Hallelujah. And remission, you sh after the remission of sins. Remission, it means a pardon. It means a freedom. It means a deliverance. It means forgiveness of sins. That's what God wants to, that's what God is offering everybody. He wants to release you from all that sin, give you a full pardon, go free of all that sin because sin weighs people's lives down. And, you know, Peter did not say, be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are titles. The Amplified, it says for those two verses, Now when they heard this, they were stung, cut to the heart, and they said to Peter, to the rest of the apostles, who were the special messengers, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter answered them, Repent, change your views and purpose to accept the will of God in your inner selves, instead of rejecting it. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of and release from your sins. 
and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he's, it's a gift. It's to be received. And then if we turn to Acts 22, verse 16, or I can read it, 22, verse 16, it says here, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did it say? Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. All right. Now, we're just going to read a, a short story here in Acts chapter 8 about a man. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And starting verse 26, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, that was one of Jesus' apostles, saying, Arise and go towards the south into the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, that's the Holy Spirit, said to Philip, go near and join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran hither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand what you're reading. And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which, was, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaks this prophet? of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So, you know, God knows everybody. He knows what we go through. He knows every situation. He was this man desiring to know, understand God's word. And so God brought uh, one of his ministers along to help this man understand what, what it was all about. And this eunuch man, this Ethiopian man, he had such an open heart that he just received the word of God. And then he realized, well, he could get baptized. Because Jesus said, go and get baptized. Once you believe, then you go and get baptized. So he said, well, here's the water. Let's go do it. And Philip said, that's fine. All right. So it's obedience to what Jesus said. Now, water baptism, it's a burial and a resurrection. It's a new beginning. And as a new disciple, water baptism reveals outwardly the decision from your heart to surrender to the Lord, to die from your old ways, your old life, and to follow in the ways of the Lord. Hallelujah. Follow in the ways of Jesus Christ according to his word. And in the natural, a burial takes place when someone dies. We understand that in the natural, when someone has their last breath and they literally die. Water baptism is also a burial, but it's a burial of your old life and your old ways. And then because we left you in the water, you would die, you'd drown. <laughs> so it's a burial of your old ways. But then you are raised up, you come back, we pull you up out of the water to walk in a new life empowered by God. Hallelujah. It's, um, it's a very real experience and Jesus wants all believers to experience it. Hallelujah. And I'll just read it. Colossians 2 verse 12. It says, buried with him in water baptism, wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Speaking of Jesus Christ. But we are buried with him. Just like Jesus was water baptized and literally how Jesus died 
and then he rose from the dead, we too go through that rising from the dead of our old ways to come back to life, to walk God's ways. Now, Romans chapter 1, sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. So that's just after the book of Acts. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And we read here, this is what? This is what we read here. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Grace is God's unmerited favour, God's favour. Should we just keep sinning and just expect God to just keep forgiving us? And the answer is, verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sins live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us were baptised into Jesus Christ, were baptised into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Hallelujah. And so when we look at scripture, we see our old man, our old nature is mentioned in the next verse, verse six, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So the old man is our old sinful ways and it must be put to death so the new man can rise up and walk with God. Hallelujah. And I'll just turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Ephesians 4. And it says here, that you put off concerning the former conversational, that's the, the lifestyle, the behavior of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, true holiness. You know, you don't hear about true holiness on the six o'clock news. True holiness. God is holy. And you read about God's ways, God's standards in the Bible. And we're also told in the following scripture, it's a new beginning. I'll just read it. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. Isn't that wonderful? No matter what's gone down in our life, no matter. And some people have had a real lot go down in our life, in their lives. No matter what's gone down in our life, God wants to bury it. He can heal our past. We can't change our past. God can heal our past. But God wants us to leave it behind and make a fresh start in him. And it says in Galatians 6.15, For in Christ there's neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. God's going to do something new on the inside. That's what he's doing. And Colossians 3, 10, it says, And put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So water baptism, in water baptism, we receive a new beginning and a new name. Water baptism is in God's name. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 5, just before the book of Revelation, right down the back. 1 John chapter 5. And scripture shows that God is three. So 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, and it says here, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. They're one in purpose, working in complete unity. And then I'll read it um, we read of, or we can turn to it, John chapter 1, speaking of Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. We just said that God, the Godhead was God the Father, God the Word, God the Holy Spirit. So it says here, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, God the Word, was made flesh and he dwelt amongst people to reveal who God was. Hallelujah. 
And let's just turn to this scripture. It's Proverbs. So it's just after Psalms in the middle of the book here. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. And it says here, Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you can tell? All right. What is his name and what is his son's name? Can you tell? Do you know it? Well, we know the son's name is Jesus. According to what was said by the angel in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Let's read it because we're talking about the name of God here. And we really need to get hold of this. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. It says here, now this is, this is how it came about, the birth of Jesus. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse, that means engaged to Joseph. So they're only engaged, okay. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her in a public example, not willing to embarrass her, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is the Holy Ghost, is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took him, un, him, took unto him his wife and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. All right. So we know the name of the son. God makes everything in the scriptures. God just puts it really, makes it really plain. And then Jesus, um, and remember, Jesus told his disciples what to do. And he said, and they followed his command. And we read it in Matthew 28, verse 19, 20. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. Jesus infers then that the Father has a name. Because he said, baptize him, the na baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus infers here that the Father has a name. The Son, we know his name, his name's Jesus, and the Holy Spirit has a name. So the Godhead, let's just look at that because we just read before that uh, God is three, right? We read that before. And in Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him. I'll read it. it Colossians 2 verse 9. In him, Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the Amplified says, for in him, in Jesus, the whole fullness of the deity of the Godhead continues to dwell bodily in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. So God, it's the Godhead. And so the name of the Godhead, when Jesus said, go and teach them, Jesus was implying that each member of the Godhead has a name. The son's name, we've just done it, isn't it? The son is not, but let me just say this, son is not the name of a person, but it is a title. Now I have a, um, a young man sitting here in front of me and if I just, if um, his name is Stephen, he's, his father may call him son, but his name is Stephen, all right? There's a difference. It's the same person, but son is a title and his name is Stephen, all right? So we just read there that the son's name was confirmed that his name should be called Jesus. And so that's really clear. The son's name is Jesus. So what is the name of the father and what is the name of the Holy Spirit? All right, let's firstly look at the father's name. Throughout the Old and New Testament, there are many references to the name of God and many scriptures show that Lord is the name of the father. 
Exodus 15. Let's turn to it. Exodus 15. Right back at the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus 15 and verse 3. It says here, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Isaiah 42, 8. Isaiah 42, 8. It says here, I am the Lord. That is my name. That's really clear, isn't it? I am the Lord. That is my name. And Jeremiah, which is the next book, Jeremiah 16, 21. 16, 21, it says, Therefore, behold, I will this once cause thee to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. All right, and Jeremiah 33, verse 2. 33, verse 2. 33, verse 2. And it says, thus says the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. And if we just go to Amos, which is just a little bit further on. Amos chapter 4. Look, it's all throughout scripture. But, you know, Jesus, the Lord says in the mouth of two or three, let everything be established. But I'm giving you more than two or three examples. Amos chapter 4 verse 13. Just the last part. It says the Lord. The God of hosts is his name. Amos 5, verse 8, the last bit. The Lord is his name. Amos 9, verse 6, it says, the last bit. The Lord is his name. And uh, Micah, we can find that's just a couple more books over. Micah chapter 6, verse 9, it says, The Lord's voice cries unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. He will... He, hear ye the rod and who has appointed it. The man of wisdom shall see thy name. So God wants us to have insight, understanding, wisdom to know his name. And Jesus himself said his father has a name. I'll read it. It's John 5, 43. Jesus said, I have come in my father's name. And also Jesus said in John 25, the works that I do, Jesus, in my father's name, they bear witness of me. So, Father is not the name of the person, but it is the title. And so, the name of the Father is Lord. The Holy Spirit's name, I believe, the Holy Spirit, which is the title of the Holy, is the title of the third person of the Godhead, has a name. When Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit, he became Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One or Jesus Christ. Let's turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 26. It says here, Jesus, what Jesus says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. And in 1526, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. He, the Holy Spirit, is the third one of the Godhead. Just as the Father and Son have a name, so does he have a name. And his name is Christ. So water baptism is in the name of the Godhead, not the title. So the revelation that each member of the Godhead has a name has been hidden from many. And Jesus revealed the name of the Godhead to his disciples. John chapter 17, verse 25 to 26. Jesus said here, a righteous father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Jesus instructed his disciples 
how to correctly baptize people. And you know, uh, an important observation here is that in the book of Acts, there is not one baptism performed by the apostles Peter, John or Paul using the title of Father, of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Not one. Not one. Rather, in each baptism, the names of the Godhead were used, not their titles. For example, we'll just... Uh, In each baptism, as shown in the New Testament, it was either Lord or Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ. And I actually believe it would have been the Lord Jesus Christ because that was the instruction given to them by Jesus. And further, there's not one example in the whole Bible where people were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not one. The whole Bible, not one example. Jesus taught his disciples how to do it, how to baptize people correctly. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. Just the next book after John, Acts chapter 2. And it says here in verse 32. And it says, This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being at by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And another way of saying that is Lord Jesus Christ. And in this name, that is how baptism must be done. And in verse 38, uh, Jesus' disciples baptized in the name. Verse 38, and Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't say of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. He said of the name Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And verse 39, just reading on, it says here, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Everybody listening to my voice, God has called you. you are already, God is, the call goes out and God wants hearts to respond to him. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there must have been a lot of people at that meeting, don't you think? 3,000 souls were baptized that day. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread, which also speaks of communion, and in prayers. Hallelujah. So praise God. So they were all baptized. They heard the word, and then they obeyed the word. And in Acts chapter 8, we see Philip speak of the things of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So this is not a men's only thing or a male only thing. Um, in Christ there's neither male nor female. God sees us. He looks on the heart, not on the gender. So hallelujah. And uh, Peter and John, they were involved with a water baptism in just down in verse 16. And it says, and at that time they used the name Lord Jesus. So verse 16, but as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right. And then 10 verse 48, it says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They prayed they him to tarry certain days and Peter used the full name and addressed Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 11 verse 17 it says here for as much then as God gave them the like gifts as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ what was I that I could withstand God hallelujah and then Acts chapter 19 so I'm just giving you all these examples just to confirm to you God's 
how God wants it done, not how man thinks it should be done, how God says in his book it's to be done. Acts chapter 19, Paul baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Acts chapter 19 and verse 5. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So how do we get called by God's name? In water baptism. And I'll just read it again. Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So the disciples were commanded by Jesus to baptize all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, okay? And they did exactly that. Again, this scripture implies that each member of the Godhead has a name. And this is a revelation that many don't even understand yet. In the body of Christ, many don't have it. So that's why I'm speaking it today. So I can put it out there on the uh, YouTube, on the, on the website, on the television, so it can get out. Because this is the name of God. And it's been hidden. In fact, in, uh, is it Judges, Manoah? It was, they said, uh, the... Manoah asked the angel, what is God's name? And the, and the angel said, it is a secret. It is a secret. But now's the time. In this time, in this generation, we're coming into the end times. We're already in the end times. And God is opening up his word. And so God wants to give us revelation, understanding of his word. Hallelujah. And so what that scripture is saying, I believe it's saying, Jesus is saying, go you there and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, that is Lord, in the name of the Son, and that is Jesus, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, that is Christ. Baptizing him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So why do we need God's name? There's two reasons. Number one, it's God's character. God names everything according to their character. And we have God's name on us. We are to spiritually grow up into the full character of God, like Father, like Son. And the second reason is because we're going to be married. It's a spiritual marriage. It's all right. It's a spiritual marriage. All right. It says, um, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. And we read here, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have a spouse, that means engaged, betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ, right? A chaste virgin to Christ. When somebody is born again, no matter what's happened in their background, when someone is born again, they are like a virgin, pure before God, right? He wants us to remain pure, God-ordained marriage. Now, in the Western societies, when a woman gets married, she takes her husband's name. However, according to Jewish tradition, the woman takes the name of her husband to be when she gets espoused or engaged or betrothed or receives a promise of marriage. And as Christians, believers, we have been espoused, engaged to Jesus Christ. Therefore, we need his name on us. And I'll read it, Romans 7. I'll, I'll turn to Romans 7 verse 4. You don't have to turn to everything, but I'll, I'll put this topic up on the website so you can get it all, the scriptures. Romans 7 verse 4. And it says here, Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You know, some fruit, some of the things that were happening in our life, we would be ashamed of now. But thankfully, God's forgiven us and uh, we go on in him. And then it says in Revelation 19, verse 7, I'll read it. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and her wife has made herself ready. So the spiritual joining together of the lamb, who's Jesus, with his wife is called the marriage of the lamb. And his wife is not singular in number, but rather multiple in number. And his wife is spiritually mature is the spiritually mature, perfected church made of men and women. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and he's going to have a bride who will have his name on her. Hallelujah. All right. Holy, ba Holy Spirit baptism. Who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? We read early in 1 John 5, 7, for the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God is three, yet one. God the Father, God the Word, and God the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the third person or the third being of the Godhead. And after Jesus concluded his ministry, he returned to heaven. However, Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit was to dwell in you. Let's turn back to John chapter 14. John 14. And it says here in 15, and I'll just read it to 17. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he, this is the comforter, may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, like an unsaved person can't receive him, you have to be saved, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and shall be in you. Hallelujah. And verse 26, it says, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. And verse 15, verse 26, it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. And what we see what Jesus said in John 16, verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. So Jesus always told the truth. Okay. I tell you the truth it is expedient for you that I go away. So Jesus was going to go back to heaven. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And also verses 13 and 14, it says, But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All right, so Jesus was just, as the man, was in one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit can be in believers all over the world. All right, Jesus he, he, he just functioned at one, one place, one time. But the Holy Ghost in believers, it's like God all over the world ministering to people. It's awesome and it's God. It's all about God's plan. And so we need the Holy Spirit to guide us so we can understand God's word. And also in John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible is a spiritual book. The natural man can't understand it. It's a spiritual book. It's been inspired by God. So the Holy Spirit has been given to lead and guide us in understanding the Bible, to understand all God's word of truth. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's unprofitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture has been inspired by God. And in 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 20 to 21, I'll, I'll show this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in all by the will of men, but by holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, so there's the Holy Ghost mentioned in the Old Testament. All right, now this is really important. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. So we're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, verses 11 to 13, and it says here, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? shall your heavenly father 
give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. The Holy Spirit is holy. And so he will only go into a saved heart. So every saved person who asks the Father shall be given the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Read what um, Jesus said here. Jesus said, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And verse 8, and it says, And you shall receive, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So that all means, you know, where you live, in your suburb, in the township, in the state, rest of the world. It's wherever you are. God wants you to be a witness. Hallelujah. And it says you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come on you. We need the person of the Holy Spirit and that power, that empowering to enable us to be a witness of God. It gives you, Holy Spirit gives you a boldness to speak. Hallelujah. But it's him in us. Hallelujah. And the Amplified for that verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the other and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. Hallelujah. All right, chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was full, so Jesus has now gone back to heaven, right? And he said, go down and wait in Jerusalem till you receive the power, till you receive the promise. And here it is. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in the place, in one place. And suddenly came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And verse 32, 33, it says here, This Jesus has God raised up whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father of the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. That's twice heard them. And oh, just, um, just chapter 2, just back on oh, verse 38, it said here, and Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the Amplified of that verse 38, it says, Peter answered them, Repent, change your views and purpose to accept the will of God in your inner selves instead of rejecting it, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness and release from your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. And then Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says here, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And Acts chapter 5, verse 30 to 32, verse 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. <clears throat> Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. God will give the Holy Spirit to them that obey him, obeying his word. And then Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 12, <clears throat> it says here, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles were at Jerusalem, 
heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 There's an impartation through the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10. And it says here in verse 44 to 45, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Hallelujah. Fell on all of them. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles, these were supposedly the non-Jews, right? Also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So how did Peter know that they had received the Holy Spirit? Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They heard them speak in this heavenly language. And verse 47, 48, then what did Peter say to do? Then he said, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. The Holy Spirit will dwell in a saved person. So these people actually were filled with the Holy Spirit and then they were water baptized in the name of the Lord. They did it the other way around. It can happen the other way around, all right? But usually people get saved, then water baptized, then filled with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 11, verse 15, it says here, And Peter returned to Jerusalem, and he was questioned about the Gentiles, and he said, As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. This is Acts chapter 11, verse 15 to 17. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? If God's going to fill them with the Holy Spirit, then Peter's saying, well, then um, we're definitely going to fill, um, water baptize them. All right. So both are important in our walking God. And then Acts chapter 13, verse 52, it says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So if you're a disciple, you're going to have joy and you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's God's plan. And just Acts chapter 19, an, an example of the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Acts chapter 19, starting verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. And he said unto them, unto, And they said unto John's baptism, And then said Paul, John verily or truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So praise God. There was an impartation, the laying on of hands. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues. And let's turn back to Mark and see what Jesus said. Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 17. And it says here, this is what Jesus said. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. And they shall speak with new tongues. He's not talking about speaking in French or speaking in Spanish. He's talking about the language of God. It's called other, we call it other tongues. The speaking in new tongues is the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And just like you speak in your native language, the Holy Spirit uses your tongue and speaks in his language to God. 
It's really powerful. It's amazing. And it's a gift from God. So we're nearly there. So in summary, you know, every family has a name, even God's family. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And it says here, For this cause I bow my knee, knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Right? The whole family in heaven and earth is named. We receive God's name in water baptism, not even at salvation. It's only in water baptism because that's what Jesus said, baptize them in the name. And, you know, there are many people throughout the world called Jesus, but there's only one Lord Jesus Christ. And we are his disciples, Christians, Christ in us. And let's look at it, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And it says here, And when they had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And then if we just look at Philippians chapter 2, this is really important. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, it says here, Wherefore God has highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is the most powerful name to be given to believers. It's the full name of the Godhead. And at the commandment of Jesus, it is received through water baptism. And I'll read it. Finally, Jesus said, now let's do it again. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Lord is the name of the Father. Jesus is the name of the Son. Christ is the name of the Holy Spirit. There is only one Lord Jesus Christ and his name is to be given to a saved person in full immersion water baptism. Amen. Therefore, the correct water baptism is I baptize you, name the person, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then fully immerse the person in the water, bring them up and lay hands on them, believing them to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to God. And everyone said, Amen.